this is my 380XD ThinkPad. So today, what we're going to be doing is, well, installing OpenBSD 6.5 on it. Okay, but before we can, well, install OpenBSD, we have to fix a few errors. So the first thing is, well, uh, the 161 and 163 CMOS errors. So essentially the computer won't post to the dead CMOS battery. Uh, the original batteries are a little bit bigger than CR2032 cells, but if you have a CR2032 CMOS battery and are willing to splice it, you can just use the old battery connectors to, well, install the new battery. Also, you probably should check the voltage on the uh, CR2032 you're adding to, well, the uh, 380XD's original CMOS battery. So, for this, I just broke out a uh, wrench to use as a, well, soldering mount and added a little bit of solder, then heat shrink. Okay, so now that we have our CMOS battery installed, we just need to, well, set the date and time. So, if you end up going into the BIOS, um, it's F1 on these laptops, but you have to press it at a certain time. I think, though, for the CMOS battery thing, it'll just land you back into the uh, BIOS, but it's been a while since I originally filmed this, so I'm not entirely sure, but... Um, I guess that was the uh, current time, uh, May 9th, so either way though, I was still having some issues with my ThinkPad, and the main issue was, well, it wouldn't read a, a, any sort of like hard disk and would always just uh, say there's no boot media from it. So eventually I figured out it was this ribbon cable that was underneath the motherboard, but uh, at the time, I wasn't sure about the error. So I had a little bit of sentimental value for my 380XD, and I found a relatively cheap uh, parts unit. It seems like the previous owner had a brick system uh, with a uh, BIOS password and dead CMOS battery, so they tried to reflash the EEP ROM. Um, I don't know if they gave up on the project because of the dead screen or something similar, but either way, um, I could use the system to replace the case with something that isn't uh, cracked and replace the uh, disk drive and hard drive ribbon cable. So unfortunately though, the hard drive ribbon cable is underneath the motherboard. So we're pretty much gonna be doing a complete disassembly on this. Okay, so now that I was done uh, messing around with the parts unit, I decided to use it as a donor system, and I also had to, well, remove the motherboard uh, to uh, essentially replace the hard drive cable on my machine. I'm not, not exactly swapping it out, but uh, it requires a complete disassembly. Um, luckily, uh, taking it completely apart just requires a small Phillips screwdriver and a hex socket bit will help out a lot with removing the screw mounts for the parallel, VGA, and serial ports. But for most upgrades, a Phillips should be all that you need. Also, um, if you're using one with swappable bits, there's a chance that it might not be long enough to reach the bottom of the case. And you do need to remove, well, the uh, essentially keyboard and top plastics to upgrade pretty much uh, everything on this machine or fix uh, even like CD drives and floppy disks, uh, CPU, motherboard, everything's underneath there. So. Annoying thing about that are these ribbon cables, which are relatively easy to take off, but uh, very difficult to be put back in, and if they're a little bit off, they'll throw some weird error messages. Okay, so a little bit about the 380XD while, uh, I guess, uh, disassembly footage is playing. It came out in 1998. Uh, 
It either has a Pentium 2 or a MMX processor. The CPUs are swappable. They come on these little modules. I think the fastest CPU though for the 380XD is like a Pentium 2 400 megahertz, but they're pretty rare. And uh, honestly, I am perfectly fine with my 300 megahertz Pentium 2. But um, the main constraint for this uh, computer is the amount of memory, which can be only expanded to 160 megabytes. So, essentially, there is some memory that's like soldered onto the board, and uh, for the rest of the 380 series, I can't verify the difference on model parts and compatibility, but they're pretty similar, and that's one of the main things that like separates like, uh, you know, like a 380 XD, 380Z, or the uh, processor screen. Um, they used uh, various panels like uh, I think this one has an HPA panel, but DSTN and TN panels were also used. Um, overall, I think the working condition ones are a bit too expensive on eBay right now, but uh, parts units or not working models might be worth it if you're interested in rebuilding one of these. Um, so now that the obligatory overview is done, I was originally messing with this before I moved apartments, and unfortunately, well, the motherboard had the CMOS battery connector breaking off, which actually wasn't the worst thing, because I did get some pretty good footage from it. So, I had to, uh, I guess, start over, so I just completely disassembled the system. And um, I even took the heat shielding off the uh, motherboard to solder it. And, you know, it's actually quite a small board for having a uh, Pentium 2 module on it. Um, but uh, it resulted in these nice photo shots. So I guess uh, that is a complete disassembly of the 380XD. So I guess moving on, I should just point out the parts for common upgrades. That's essentially where the hard drive would go. Um, you can use uh, these little uh, MSATA adapters and they work perfectly fine in my experience. Um, the disk drive was dead, but fortunately the parts unit had a working disk drive. And over there underneath the uh, heat shielding is the CPU. So. All of these are under the keyboard, and like I said, those ribbon cables are a bit of a pain, but when it's all put together, it looks quite nice. So, moving on, let's uh, get out of the territory of disassembly and actually get into installation. So, the first thing I did was change the boot order in the BIOS, and then next was essentially just putting in a card bus network card even though I was using the CD install for OpenBSD 7.2. Um, for OpenBSD, um, the current version doesn't exactly support the NeoMagic graphics card, which uh, kind of just limits it to VESA uh, if you can get it working or just text-based uh, applications. But um, Rather than having X crash, everything seemed to work fine for the most part. Um, so if you're just gonna use it as like a terminal um, CLI interface, um, you're perfectly fine with uh, the current version of OpenBSD. But um, I wanted to, well, have some sort of uh, Windows Manager running and Essentially, just a little bit more than just the basic CLI interface. Okay, so before continuing, I switched the solid state drives. Mainly um, for two reasons. One wasn't sitting quite flush with the adapter, which isn't the biggest issue, but uh, having a old 32 gigabyte, well, 
MSATA drive is a little bit uh, questionable, especially if you uh, have something like randomly fail on you just because it had so many like read writes over time. So, okay, so let's get into the OpenBSD 6.5 installation. Um, so, essentially, it's mostly straightforward. Um, I did have to use eu.openbsd.org. I went with 6.5 because it was the last version of OpenBSD that had essentially NeoMagic drivers. Um, another thing is, if you notice, it's an HTTP link, and that's because I do not have the uh, proper or a modern uh, certification file for SSL. So we're gonna fix that. And the first thing I installed was, well, wget and neofetch. So let's see, uh, essentially after this installs, we can download our file. So then I just copied the new cert.pem file generated by wget to slash etc SSL. Okay, so now that um, everything's installed on um, terms of like just the basic setup where you can log in and install packages with Xterm and then essentially uh, just open BSD with X working. We can go and, well, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word, rice the system. So, I was thinking about going with uh, i3WM originally, but uh, based off our limited RAM at 160 megabytes, I decided to go with DWM and used ST as my, well, terminal. So. Let's uh, take a look at that. Okay, so let's see uh, the newly riced OpenBSD setup boot in, well, 4x speed. Okay, so this is 25 year old hardware, so it does take a little bit long to start up. So let's log in to our newly uh, riced setup, which uh, was mainly done to, well, lower RAM usage, but I wanted a background, so I just invoked fe in the accession file. So the uh, background image is essentially just, uh, well, image magic and plasma, but uh, either way, let's talk about um, ST for a bit. So I tried a variety of methods to get ST to read the dot profile, but the one that worked was UTMP. Um, essentially, for UTMP, it's uh, relatively easy to compile, there's just a little script. And from there, you just have to change um, your ST uh, config to just, well, add um, UTMP. So, I just put that string there instead of the original value of null. Now I can have a the directory listed and um, some uh, color ls stuff. So either way, um, if you want to take a look at the PS1 file, it isn't that complicated. But I did have one problem with, well, package add. So essentially, um, package add would invoke some uh, end curses thing, which I think is more of a problem of like, what uh, patches I applied or didn't apply to ST, but uh, because of that, it would just not uh, or refuse to run in the ST shell. Okay, so essentially I had to alias package add to do as package add slash x slash vvv. And well, I guess I didn't have to use slash vvv, but uh, you know, having verbose output is kind of nice. So with that, uh, I tested a few applications. Um, I think this uh, shows kind of the performance of it. Uh, the other thing that actually does surprisingly well is, uh, well, browse the web. Um, 
It's not going to do everything, and the sites uh, are a little bit uh, awkward to browse on Duo, but uh, I managed to uh, get to the uh, ThinkWiki page on the 380XD just fine. And um, I imagine uh, most people um, doing this type of setup would be uh, more inclined to go with like something like OpenBSD 7.2, have up-to-date software, and uh, maybe install a server or something uh, similar to that. Um, in terms of uh, performance, um, the OS generally uses like 50 to 70 megabytes of RAM, which is uh, pretty usable. You have like a extra 90 megabytes to uh, run your software. It does lag a little bit while uh, moving around uh, windows in monocle mode or any floating windows, but uh, overall I'd say the uh, performance was uh, better than expected. I guess um, in conclusion, OpenBSD does run on old hardware, and uh, even the latest version will run just fine. Um, Originally, I was going to test this with, well, Arc Linux. Um, okay, so now to address the elephant in the room. Why did I go with OpenBSD instead of Arc32? Okay, so, error. That's fine, right? But uh, then I'd have to take the SSD out of the system. And then I'd have to run the script again on a questionable, like, MSATA, I guess, solid state drive with uh, probably 32 gigabytes. And in the past, I have actually burned one of these up doing something similar. So I don't really use them for things like this. And after that, uh, long installation was over. Or relatively quick in comparison to uh, installing stuff on the Pentium 2 from the CD drive. Um, I would then have to take the MSATA drive out of the adapter after testing if it would boot up on the T420, put it back into the, uh, well, 380XD, and then essentially uh, have another error. But each time I'm kind of just uh, leveling the uh, SSD's uh, read-write count. And uh, I've also had Debian 11 run on it. Um, I think this is footage from the uh, disk upgrade. So overall, in conclusion, um, I went with OpenBSD, a slightly older release. So, have a good one. I will revisit uh, ARC32, probably on a T40 or maybe like a T60 or something with a 32-bit processor. I'm sure it's a wonderful distribution, but uh, in this case, OpenBSD won the contest in being uh, functional from the get-go.